today we are taking a journey over the next 40 days as we are headed towards the cross of our forgiveness, the cross of Christ's crucifixion, and of course the great celebration of Easter, his resurrection from the dead. It's good to be here gathered with you today. Uh, let's see, a couple of things for announcements this morning. Earlier this morning we stirred the waters of baptism. We baptized Brody Lane Nerderman, who is Caitlin Nimitz's son. Um, so that was a great, joyous thing. Uh, you can see the flowers for them uh, here today. And so we're thanking God that he is continuing to bring people into his family through his gift of baptism. Uh, Lenten worship schedule, I've pretty much made you aware of. Um, pretty soon we'll give you what's going to be happening on Holy Week. Uh, but we want to come, we want to invite you to be a part of our Wednesday worship services, midweek. Lenten services, uh, come and join us. Oh, that was a header. Yeah, it's definitely a header. Wait. <laughs> at 6.30. Uh, come and join us at 6.30. At 6.15, uh, we'll be having a hymn sing. Come and join us. Stump the organist time. It, it's a really fun time, and especially with Kathy's playing. So uh, come and join us at 6.15 for the hymn sing. Our worship service starts at 6.30. I'll have you out in 45 minutes, okay? So uh, come and join us for those. Uh, let's see. That, that, that. Uh, two things. I think there's a couple of Available. There's one slide for our eighth grade fundraiser. It's a rummage sale. We're asking uh, for donations for that. If you have something that uh, might be useful for a rummage sale, you can bring it to um, the school. We're collecting items on the stage in the gym currently um, for that rummage sale. That's going to be on March 6th. Uh, if you want more information, call the school office. And then also, we need to get ready for our school auction this year, which is online. Uh, March 11th through 14th. If you would like more information about that, I would reach out to Carrie Baum. That's a good resource. Uh, tell you how that be unfolding. So, um, anyway, two exciting things coming up, and we're doing them to the best of our ability at this time, so I'm excited for that. Our uh, worship today is Divine Service Setting 4. It's printed out before you. Let's begin with our opening hymn, 418. <laughs> Before God and one another 
that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together, as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ, and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us. Forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and it is for his sake that he forgives you all of your sin. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We speak our intro at responsibly this morning. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him. And show him my salvation. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place. The Most High, who is my refuge. No evil shall be allowed to befall you. No plague shall near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you. To guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up. Lest you strike your foot against the stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder. The young lion and the serpent you will trample on your blood. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, it is now, and will be forever. Amen. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him. And show him my salvation. When they came to the place of which God had told him, 
Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. The angel of the Lord said, Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, The Lord Will Provide. As it is said to this day, On the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. This is the word of the Lord.
The epistle reading is from James chapter 1, verse 12 through 18. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do not, do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of firstfruits of his creatures. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Please rise for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the first chapter. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens opening, the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. The Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness forty days, being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please join me in confessing our Christian faith this morning in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father,
in prayer. And that we would come to your word so that we might know what your will and desire is in all times. This morning, Lord, I ask that you would bless the words of my mouth and the meditations of each of our hearts. May they be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Today's epistle reading comes from the book of James, which I absolutely love. James, the brother of Jesus and leader in the early Christian church, had much to say about the Christian life. And not just any bit of the Christian life, but the mature Christian life. And he wrote about what the mature Christian life should look like. James famously teaches that Christian faith, without the good works that should accompany that faith, is dead in its impact, dead in its effectiveness, and dead in its evangelistic call towards the neighbor. James famously spends almost an entire chapter talking about taming the tongue. He says that words are extremely important. Words are extremely powerful, either for good or for evil. In the book of Proverbs, we learn this, my favorite proverb, Proverbs 25, 11, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in a setting of silver. However, James in chapter 3, verse 8 of his epistle also says this, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. James is the mature Christian book of our New Testament, but before he talks about faith without works is dead, before he talks about the power of our words, James in this little epistle of his teaches us something even more foundational even more fundamental and formative for the Christian life. James, a writer who is truly a writer for today's world, brings us into the essence of what this season we are in, the season of Lent, is all about. Today, talking about trials and temptations. He starts in verse 12 like this, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast, under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Blessed, says James, blessed is the one who remains steadfast under trial. This is the same word that Jesus uses in the Beatitudes. Blessed are you. And if you remember, he says, blessed are you, meek, weak, humble, crying, suffering people. Blessed. The Greek word makarios means happy. Really, is what it means. It means the feeling of being fortunate. Peter joins in the same tune in his letter to the church in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6. He says, in this you should rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, which, by the way, is more precious than gold, that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise, in glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So, Jesus, his little brother James, and his number one disciple Peter all say that when you go through trials in this life, you should feel blessed. You should feel fortunate. Why? Why? Why is the trial, why is the testing of our faith a necessary thing for this Christian life? We know that God allows these things. God allows trials in our life to strengthen our faith and our reliance on Him. Now, to be crystal clear, trials are often
in almost every time, not fun. And to be crystal clear, trials often spring out of things that are not good. Does God think COVID-19 is good? No, God does not think COVID-19 is good. He created us without sin. He created us without sickness. He created us without death. God desires the death of no one. In fact, his primary will in Jesus Christ is that all people be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Can God work something good out of COVID-19 and any variant strain that comes with it? Yeah, absolutely he can. And I know that he is. Have we learned to rely more on him in this time? I know I have. I hope you have as well. I've had to rely on a God who is just simply bigger than me. Bigger than numbers. Bigger than a microscopic novel virus. I hope you have learned reliance on him. I hope that you have learned to appreciate what we are doing this morning. What we are doing right now in worship, being together. I hope that you have learned the importance of relationships. Of touch. Of time spent with people we love. As we, for this time, fast from those things. And I pray above all that we all learn this, the need to be ready, the need to be ready for Christ's kingdom, the need to be ready for his return, not tomorrow ready, but today ready. The Christian faith is one of imminence. We cannot be, as the Texans say, fixing to get right with God. <laughs> now is the time. This past year has been an example of a trial that should strengthen our faith and reliance on God and has been a trial on a global proportion. And I know that you've had your own personal trials and I have had mine. And we do not have enough time today to talk about all of the trials of all of God's people in Scripture. We read about Abraham this morning. Suffice it to say today, trials are good. And they are good because they are hard. And they are good because they are painful. They are good because they highlight your weakness. When you are made low, Christ is exalted. And when you have nothing of yourself, nothing to turn to, nothing to run to, Christ is your everything. That's good. That is what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 10. He says, For the sake of Christ, then I am content with weaknesses, insults, Hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Leaning on Christ, clinging to Christ, is the strongest you'll ever be, I assure you. Trials are good. Temptations, temptations are a whole different beast. Verse 13, James says this, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. Temptations like trials are difficult things, yes. Trials are things that come to us, beset us, affect us, 
hopefully mold us and shape us and strengthen us in our need and our reliance with him. Temptations are something else. Temptations are another beast. Temptations are the three-headed beast. And if you've had confirmation with me, you know what the three-headed beast is. Temptations are from the devil, the world, and our own sinful nature. That's where temptations come from. The devil, the world, and our own sinful nature. We said that trials that God allows, and he does allow them, can often strengthen our faith and strengthen our reliance on him. But that's not what a temptation is. Temptation is a one-way street. It only leads one place towards sin. The three-headed monster, the devil, the world, and our own sinful nature leads us into temptation and leads us away from God. Temptations do not strengthen but weaken our faith. They are, by nature, self-serving and inward-focused. James says it like this in verse 14. Each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. God's word tells us what to do with temptation. It does. We read in the book of wisdom, the Proverbs. We read it recently in our online Bible study. We read what Solomon tells us to do with temptation. Joseph, in the house of Potiphar's wife, teaches us what to do with temptation. Paul, over and over again in the New Testament, tells us what we should do with temptation. Flee from it. Flee from it. Don't fight it. Flirt with it. Laugh at it. Or play around with it. Flee from it. It's the way Paul says in verse 10, uh, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13 says, No temptation has overcome you or overtaken you. That is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Why a way of escape? Why flee from it? Simply this. It's more than you. The three-headed monster is more than you. It is smarter than you, more tenacious than you. It's been at this longer than you. And the three-headed monster's greatest tool is the law. The devil of the world and our own sinful nature is a liar. Oh, it's just an idol. Oh, it's just a little gossip. Oh, it's just thoughts in my head. I'd never do it. Oh, it's just another drink. I can always stop it. It's just images on a screen. I can always erase it. It's just this once. I can always forget it. But Satan, the adversary, your enemy, has a great memory. And he excels. He loves bringing up old dirt. When we are tempted, my friends, there is much more at stake than we can perceive in the moment. This is important. There's much more at stake than we can perceive in the moment. That is why we must never ever be comfortable with temptation and be comfortable with our sin. 
It is, in fact, an, an assault against our identity, an attack against who we are, our life in Christ. You see, in one breath, the three-headed monster says, Hey, it's all right. Everyone does that. And then after the deed is done, sings a whole different tune. Do you really think God can forgive you of that? Are you really who you say you are? You don't really believe, do you? And then we take the fork in the road and head away from God and head away from forgiveness and head away from the cross and away from his presence and then we head towards the place that he is not. James says it this way in verse 15. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. The word conceived here means, means literally to seize oneself, to be overcome by oneself. It is often used to be, mean overcome by desire. And that is when sin, which is part of our sinful nature, bears fruit, sinful fruit. And when we live in temptation, walk in it, comfortably walk into it, and walk around in that sin, and do not flee from it, we end up nursing it, nurturing it, feeding it, taking care of it like a little pet. And it grows. And one day it's full grown. And it carries you off. Where you don't want to go. Trials, we said, strengthen our faith. Temptations are faith destroying things. So, my friends, here is the big question. How do we know the difference between the two? How do we know the difference between a test or a trial and a temptation. Unfortunately, we cannot turn to the Greek. It is the same exact word in Greek. We know that faith are, is strengthening, that trials are faith-strengthening things, and that temptations are faith-destroying. How can we know the difference? Go to the pastor? Not bad. Go to a friend, a Christian friend? Not bad. There is a vast place to go, however, there is one place you must go. Directly, directly to God. And thanks be to God that our God gives us two unique, important, there's probably more, but we're going to talk about two this morning, two important ways to come directly to Him. Number one is in His Word. God's Word. Verse 18 of our epistle reading, of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, the word of his truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. God brought us forth, it says, the word is begat, it means begat, he birthed you as a new creation. And it is the word of truth against the lies of this world. And it is the truth in God's word, in contrast to the three-headed monster's lies, that makes us who we are. The first fruits of a new creation that is to come. That is, you are the first fruits of the recreated things to come. And he has done this by the truth that is his word. We have his word, and it comes to us in worship. As we read the scriptures, as we study and absorb it in Bible study. And so when we are looking for discernment, and you absolutely must be looking for discernment, real Christian discernment, parsing through trials and temptations of this life, we need to be in his word, and we need to know what his word says. The things that we struggle with in this life. 
because of God's word, in light of God's word, and what it's making us, and what it's telling us, the things that we are struggling with because of God's word, those are trials, my friends, and they are glorious things. The things that we struggle with that are against God's word, that are contrary to God's word, that are contrary to his will, his desires, those are temptations. And you ought to flee from them. The second place we go to God directly is in prayer. The accounts of Jesus Christ are truly amazing things in his earthly life and ministry. The fullness of God in Jesus Christ, but was also fully man. And was tempted. And he went to his father, like, all the time. You should read it. All the time. All the time we see Jesus in prayer, often by himself, in a quiet place. All the time talking to his father. And he is not you. He is the Christ. How much more do we need to talk to our father in heaven? And when Jesus was in the midst of temptation in the wilderness, starving, being tempted by Satan, this is what he says, verse four, Matthew 4, Verse 4, he answered, It is written in the scriptures, in God's word, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus knew just exactly where to find his father in the midst of temptation. He went to his father's word, and he went to his father in prayer. And that is our teaching for today. That is our understanding for today. That is what we are called to do and to remember and to sit through and to discern in this season of Lent. To return to Christ's cross. To return to God's word. To read it. To hear it. To meditate upon it and hold it dear. So I will say this, my friends. If you are struggling with something right now, this is where I want you to turn as a pastor. This is where you should turn to the truth of God's word and to the place of the communication that God has set up with us in the gift of prayer. That is where you should go. The places where truth and life come in the midst of the roar and death of this world. To seek God's will and to know what it is for your life. And if you are indeed facing a temptation, flee from it. And if you are enduring a trial, lean into it. Lean into your Savior. Lean on your Savior. You will never be more strong than with him. May the peace of God which surpasses all understanding guard your hearts and your minds. In Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Would you please stand and join me for prayer?
preserve all catechumens and their teachers, all children and their parents, and every Christian home from the assaults of the evil one. As your son overcame Satan in the, in the desert by the word of God, so also give us the victory through Christ and his word. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. 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 Most high God, our refuge in every trouble, you have promised you here when we call to you. We pray that you would command your angels to guard and protect us, especially those brothers and sisters in this time who are in need of your care. Lord, we ask that you would bless uh, Valerie, friend of Vivian Rendoni, undergoing a lung transplant. Lord, we ask that uh, that might be successful and that you might give her swift healing. Lord, be with all of those sick and suffering uh, in any way in this time. Uh, we ask that you would care for them according to your will, that you would um, relieve their suffering in this time. Lord, we especially think of today those who are suffering with COVID-19, Lord, or recovering. We ask that you would provide relief swiftly, um, Lord, and for all people according to their needs. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. Lord God, we remember with thanksgiving those before us whom you brought forth by the word of truth who now live and reign in your presence with your Son. As you have also brought us forth by that word in our baptism, we pray that you would bring us to full maturity by your word, that we too may be gathered with them to your Son on the glorious harvest of that last day. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. All these things, and whatever else you know that we need, grant us, Father, for the sake of him who died and rose again, and now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. <clears throat> Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our
you go in God's peace, that he blesses your week. Our ushers will dismiss you by pew. I will see you in the back. Thanks be to God.